three, two, one. What is up? Ah! All right, guys. My name is Daniel Kwok. Uh, obviously, I am the sillier one of the Kwok brothers. I wish I could turn the camera around because Sam is shaking his head, eating so his dumb. eating his bag of popcorn. Obviously, I am the little brother, also the more fun brother, also the brother that does all the deals. So yeah, how about that? <laughs> all right, guys. The people have spoken. Uh, I've gotten emails and comments and et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, obviously I did a video uh, earlier this week um, on the market and where I think it's headed. Very interesting stuff. I always tell real estate investors, when you do real estate, you not only have to know your content, but you have to know your context, right? You have to understand both. And honestly, I've traveled around the country, you know, training people on real estate. I meet with a lot of sellers. I sat down with hundreds and hundreds of sellers. And honestly, one of their biggest issues is that they didn't understand the market, right? So if you want to check out that video, uh, click in the description below. There is a link for that video, but the people have spoken. Uh, we are going to today talk about a 20 unit portfolio acquisition. And this is a deal that I am doing right now, guys. I am literally negotiating this deal in the middle of negotiating. It's very, very close. Uh, the money is being very close to being raised, although it hasn't been raised yet. Uh, but anyways, um, we're going to talk about the 20 unit deal. Now, guys, obviously, I have to start off by saying, um, you know, guys, I'm not I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not a CPA. I'm not an accountant. Uh, I don't have a license, uh, a real estate license. And, you know, obviously, that's a big debacle, whether you should get a license or not. My personal opinion is that you shouldn't. I think there's more cons than pros. Uh, but there are some videos and things that we talk about. Uh, in, rel in relation to whether or not you should get a license. Because I know a lot of the young entrepreneurs that want to make money in real estate investing, you know, they one of the questions they always ask is like, Daniel, you're 24, right? You know, you've done a whole lot in real estate investing. You've done millions of dollars in transactions. You know, should I get my license, right? And I always kind of tell them the pros and cons. So check out our other material. Before I forget, guys, um, join our Facebook group. It's absolutely free. We put content there all the time. Uh, we always try and provide myself and Samuel. Uh, we always try and provide value for you guys uh, because of course we expect that you guys will turn around and do the same for other people. So the link is in the description below. If anything, it should be on the top part. Uh, join our free Facebook group. And again, as I was saying, I'm not a licensed uh, real estate uh, agent or broker. I'm not a CPA. I'm not a financial advisor. Guys, I'm just a real estate investor, a, a practicing real estate investor that does this on a daily basis. I'm just here to share some details about a deal, answer some questions. I know I got Sam, my older brother back there. He's going to be listing off questions. I know this is a live YouTube feed, so uh, he'll be kind of saying the questions as we go along. So let's go ahead and get started. Right now, I am in the uh, middle of a 20 unit acquisition. Now, if you guys are asking whether if this is an apartment or if this is, you know, uh, duplexes, triplexes, four flats. Uh, guys, this is 20 single family homes. And obviously we live in the Chicagoland area. So I'm not going to tell you where this is located, obviously, because I have to protect the integrity of the deal. And also there's some, obviously some, um, some, some things that I can't disclose uh, legally. Uh, so, and obviously there's just no point. You guys are here to learn on how to, how I personally, a little bit of how I analyze the deal. Um, just a little window into how I do it. And you guys are here to learn and get value. So uh, this is 20 houses. It's in uh, the Chicago land area. So it's currently 20 single family houses. Now, if you guys are taking notes, uh, this is kind of an interesting predicament in terms of how you exactly analyze the deal, how you value the portfolio. Uh, I know there's two main ways that properties get valued in the real estate investing world. The first is comparables, uh, which can be provided by a realtor. They do a comparative market analysis, or you can do the service yourself by going to different websites. Uh, I also know that you can look up uh, public records to see what properties got sold. Particularly, guys, when I uh, analyze comps, when I do comps, obviously there's a lot of software out there that will help you uh, with comps. Uh, if you want to get more information on that, feel free to comment, reach out to us at thequawkbrothers.com in the contact section. Uh, but I always love to use properties that are either uh, sold in the last two to three months 
Now that two, three month can be very different based on market changes. So uh, make sure that you guys are very well aware, uh, extremely well aware on how that's going to get played out, right? Uh, but I like to use uh, either sold or pending, right? Sold or pending is what I like to go off of. And so that's the first way to analyze the deals, uh, properties. The second way, obviously, is cap rate, right? And for those of you guys that are watching, I'm going to go ahead and assume that you already know what cap rate is. Uh, if not, it's basically just NOI divided by the purchase price. It's used, it's the model and the equation used to basically value a lot of um, commercial real estate, which is five plus units uh, in, in the real estate investing world. Um, so if you need to pause the video and do some exercises uh, or join the Facebook group, the, you know, the Quack Brothers Mastermind Facebook group, link is in the description below. We talk about stuff, the technicalities like that all the time. But let's go ahead and move on because I know you're here for a certain reason. So this is 20 single family houses. Now I actually did both. Uh, I did not only comps, but also I also use the cap rate. So we'll talk about how I got to those two numbers. Uh, comps right now. So we had a realtor, the seller's realtor or not the seller's realtor, but the seller had a friend uh, who was a realtor. And of course, you know, you got to obviously ask questions, right? What, what's that relationship like? You know, are, are, you know, are they intentionally pulling up the largest comp? However, in this particular situation, because you got to look at all the variables, the individual selling the portfolio is actually a contractor, general contractor. I walked through the properties myself. I'm not going to lie. They're in pristine condition. They're extremely turnkey. Um, so, you know, even if even if the realtor pulls up the best comps in that neighborhood, the you know, market, chances are, you know, it's going to be relatively accurate um just because of the condition of these houses right and on top of it this guy went the extra mile literally put in new furnaces new roofs on um a third of the houses you know really good tenants there's only three vacant right now it's because they're being worked on uh but right now the portfolio based on the comps was at 2.2 million dollars uh the current purchase price for where i currently have it at is at 1.9 Now, here's where we kind of get in a standstill, and I'll circle back around. I'll show you guys how I got this number, but when I did the cap rate, the cap rate was relatively around 7.8 to about 8.1%. Now, you guys are probably scratching your head or say, well, let's stone him because he's not giving us an actual cap rate number. Guys, you will find the more you learn about real estate investing – you will learn that it is so easy to manipulate that cap rate percentage. It is ridiculously easy to do so. One of the best ways to do that is to figure out the integrity of the expenses. Uh, you know, on top of asking for a profit and loss statement, uh, is to ask for a Schedule E or Form eighty eight twenty five. That is the official IRS tax form for uh, the expenses that get recorded with owning an investment property. So again, guys, I'm not a CPA. I'm not a licensed accountant by any means. Uh, again, I'm just a practicing real estate investor, but depending on how they own the property, they'll either have a Schedule E or a Form 8825. Again, that's the IR official IRS tax form that reports expenses on an investment property, uh, whether that's you know a, a 24 unit apartment complex or a single family house. So the range is from 7.8 to 8.1 percent cap rate. Now, again, this is what I mean at the point of you know we're kind of in a crossroads and a standstill because. Well, if we look at the comps, the purchase price of $1.9 million dignifies that we're buying this thing $300,000 less than what it's worth, which is great, right? But on the other hand, um, the market cap rate is a 9 9.5% market. And right now, the portfolio is valued at 78 to 8.1%, right? So I want you guys to really think about you know, what, what, what if you're in a situation where there's factors that tell you there's a good deal, there's factors that tell you there's a bad deal, right? And here again is where we really have to talk about what is your investor ID, right? What is, you know, according to your finances, what is most important to you, right? So let me give a quick example. I'll go right back to the numbers. So if you're a doctor making $750,000 a year, right? I know that if I have a lender who's a doctor, one of the most important things that the doctor is going to want to have in the deal is the amount of depreciation that is being offered, right? Whereas if I have a lender who is an entrepreneur, right? And, you know, they're self-employed, you know, they pay their own health insurance or they got an HSA, 
right? I know that they're going to be more focused on cash flow, right? Chances are if they have a business and they're active in their business, they may have lost carry forwards, et cetera. But I mean, you guys get the point, right? I think you guys get the point already in terms of knowing your investor ID and understanding which part, which concepts, which parts of the deal are good, which parts of the deal are bad, right? I always say with, you know, any deal, 95% of deals, there's pros and cons, right? And it's a good deal based on this guy. It's a bad deal according to person B, good deal according to person A, great deal in terms of, you know, person C, right? So let's go back to the deal. So cap rate ranges about 7.8 to uh, 8.1%. Now let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's let's really go into the nuts and bolts. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and erase this aspect. So if you guys are taking notes, I'll give you guys a couple seconds to actually write this down, which is actually good because I'm actually gonna pull up uh, the official schedule E that I got from the seller. And again, guys, these you know these are real numbers, right? This is a real life deal that I'm working on right now. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys the numbers here. Give me a second, guys. Let me pull this up. Um, let me see here. There it is. Okay, awesome. Okay, so let's talk about the gross rent. Now, of course, I'm a firm believer uh, when you're talking to a seller, when you're talking to uh, you know a lender, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, you want to have you want to be armed with great questions. One of my biggest mentors says that the better negotiator you are, the better questions that you'll have. And again, if you want tips on negotiating, because I know that's a big demand for a lot of people right now. Uh, if you want to learn how to be a better negotiator, better salesperson, I made a video. What's the number one thing that entrepreneurs, uh, salespeople have? You can go check that out. And of course, I'm paraphrasing the title. Uh, but you know, again, join the mastermind on Facebook. We talk about stuff like that all the time. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We put out great content every single week, even almost on a daily basis. So Again, let's go to the numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and erase this. So speaking of great questions, uh, one of the things that I asked the guy was, you know, I noticed that he had 20 houses. His average rent was about $1,600. Now, obviously, with 20 houses, you know, he's he had you know homes, you know, ranging rent from 825. One house rented out for 1900. Uh, story was the guy with the eight, you know, the eight eight twenty five. I believe you know he's been there for a very long time, and that's a common thing that you'll see um, with sellers. They'll say, "Oh, you know, you should buy this for this price, the one I want, because you can raise the rent." Guys, never ever, right? And please write this down, right? Because the pen is mightier than the sword. Never ever buy a piece of real estate or do a deal, even a business deal, based on what it could be. Don't ever do that. I had, I once had a you know seller, and I'll teach you guys a really good phrase right now, really good technique. Uh, I once had a seller talk to me, say, "Hey, you know, um, you know, there's rumors that this city is going to uh, develop this, and you know, you could raise the rent, and you know, 300 bucks, and that's going to force appreciate the property value a hundred thousand dollars more. So I'm only asking for fifty thousand, right? Which, from his perspective, sounds awesome. Here's my one line that I use." All the time, right? And depending on the rapport I build, the relationship, right? Uh, his personality, of course, we talk about that too in our other uh, platforms. I always say, well, you know, with all due respect, Mr. Seller, uh, do me a favor, you know, <laughs> wait three, four years until all that happens, and then I'll buy it when all that happens, right? Then I'll give you the price you want after all that happens. But I'm buying that piece of real estate or I'm buying that property for what it is right now, not what it could be, right? As far as I'm concerned, what it could be applies to my benefit. So that's my one line that I use, right? You know, then, then come back to me in three, four years when all that's happened and we'll talk to that, right? Exactly it. Okay, so let's get to the Schedule E. All right, so the reported gross income uh, was, again, reportedly $348,327. All right, so I'll go ahead and write the four out a little bit more clear so that you guys can see, which I hope you guys can get a good view. I know you guys can zoom in and out uh, of things. So I'm going to try and write as clearly as possible. According to Sam and also my girlfriend, I have the handwriting of a kindergartner with Down syndrome. So uh, no, no offense to the people who have Down syndrome. I don't mean to offend. I understand it's 2018, right? Um, I got to be PC, right? Although I like Mac. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm Korean, so I have to like Samsung. All right, so we got gross income of 
thousand dollars. Now, one of the things that you'll see a lot with individual schedule E is typically either they won't have any management costs or any maintenance costs. Let me tell you why. So one of the first deals that I ever did, one of the, I'm sorry, one of the first big deals that I did was a 36 unit apartment complex in the west suburb of Chicago. I noticed that the management was 40% of the gross income. Well, just so happens to know that the actual owner is also the manager and that's how he collects his cash flow through management fees. Obviously with sellers, right? They're going to try and ramp up their schedule as high as they can in terms of the expenses because they want the losses, right? I mean, that's pretty obvious. We all knew that, right? All right. So uh, insurance, right? So there's the gross income. Let's go down to the expenses. The insurance uh, ran about $24,136. Uh, legal and professional fees was $1,098, right? And we move on to interest. And again, interest, I understand it's not an actual expense, but you will see that consistently on a Schedule E. Unless the owner owns it outright, um, you won't see that there, that, but 90% of the time, you're going to see interest as a Schedule E. Do not be confused. Schedule E's, again, are meant to have the expenses be as high as they possibly can. So don't be confused. Don't say, well, this isn't making any money because I'll show you guys what you have to take out to actually get the real net operating income, the NOI. All right. So the interest is $31,615. We have the repairs. At about sixteen thousand seven hundred and thirty-three dollars, uh, we also have taxes. Uh, and again, guys, this is uh, Cook County, <laughs> Illinois. So, uh, for those of you guys that live in big metropolitan areas like Los Angeles uh, or New York, right, some of the bigger Democratic states, your taxes are going to be a lot higher, right? Your real estate taxes naturally are going to be, you know, especially if you're in near a metropolitan area or you share county borders with a big city like Chicago, you're going to have 20, 25, oftentimes even 30% taxes, right? I know for my secondary, you know, the, the properties that I own in the secondary market of these big metropolitan areas, uh, I'll take Chicago for one, right? You know, I got, I own a 24 unit building and a 36 unit building, an eight unit, a four unit, all in the secondary market of Chicago, on average, my taxes are 15%, right? So of course, when you get closer to a place like Chicago, they're going to be 25, 30%. If you're really good, if you have a really good appeal uh, representative, they're going to be a little lower, but that's the taxes, right? Six figures a year. Exactly. All right. Uh, let's move on to utilities. Utilities are $2,324. I'm going to go ahead to this side of the screen. Sorry for covering the uh, screen here, guys, but I'm going to try and bend over, right? I just worked on my legs today, so um, there we go. Am I good, Sam? Yeah, you're good. All right, I'm in pain right now because I just squatted, you know, uh, today. Of course, I was squatting a good 425, right? Of course. Uh, so, no, it was actually more like 180. But anyways, not to brag. All right, so moving on. So we got also wages and salary. It was blank. We also have depreciation. Depreciation was fifty thousand and ninety nine. Well, I'm sorry, ninety nine two. So nine hundred and ninety two dollars, right? So if you rack up all the expenses, if you look at line uh, fifteen, you've got equipment rental, office expenses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But line sixteen total expenses for the property uh, was three hundred and three, three seventy two. Now again, you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute. His income is $448,327. His expenses are $303,000. How is he making any money? Uh, I don't understand. So let me, again, let me show you guys how you properly read a Schedule E as a real estate investor. There's two main expenses you're going to take out. Obviously, I already talked about the interest. So we have to subtract $31,615. That gets added back into the NOI. So I'm going to go ahead and use my nice calculator here. 
uh, because obviously I hate to to say this, but I am the contrary of the ter- you know the typical stereotypical uh, Oriental Korean man. I need a calculator to be able to do these calculations. So we got three hundred and three. Uh, 100,000, 372. If you want to do this math with me at home, feel free to do that. We're going to subtract it with $31,615. Uh, that's going to give us 271,757. All right. And the second expense that we're going to subtract is indeed the depreciation. Uh, we're going to go ahead and subtract an additional $50,992. All right, so that gets us 22765. Now, when you buy a piece of property, you have to calculate the NOI not only with what the seller's got, but you have to calculate the NOI with what you're capable of doing. So obviously, I'm five foot nine, I weigh 155 pounds. You probably won't guess that I'm hefty and handy with a hammer, right? Uh, definitely not at all, right? Uh, not even right, even Sam, not hefty with a hammer at all. We're not contractors. Ask Sam. He's also not very good with mirrors, right? Uh, if you can tell with the last video, he had a little boo-boo. Uh, somebody had to drive him to the emergency video, right, or the emergency room. So we get to 22765, right? So, again, you have to calculate it based on your number. So what are some expenses that aren't listed here that obviously is going to pertain to me? Well, we forgot this little thing called maintenance. Now, in this scenario, I gave the seller a little bit of benefit of doubt uh, because he owns his own uh, contracting company. Uh, He does a lot of the maintenance himself, uh, which means that he probably put a lot of the maintenance costs under repairs because he wants to, again, and this is think like this is really, this is the art of sitting down and really giving the deal some thought, right? You really wanna focus on the details. And again, I'm not a detail-oriented guy, right? You can ask anybody who knows me really well, but this this type of stuff, right? I mean, this is a large transaction. It's a $1.9 million transaction, right? I mean, you you definitely don't wanna make mistakes. Even the littlest mistakes can cost you a lot in cash flow. So uh, there was no maintenance, right? But if you, if you really sit down and think about it, why is the repair 16,733? Well, it's probably because he puts a lot of the maintenance costs, including, you know, prices of materials, right? We're talking carpet, uh, paint, right? Probably does it all under his repair company, probably has another entity like an S Corp or an LLC, and he's just trying to funnel money through, right? So uh, I put calculated 5% for maintenance. Right now, before I move on, let me tell you guys a big, uh, you know, curveball in the deal. Uh, and this individual seller, again, I'm not going to disclose any specifics, uh, but he did have a lot of vacancy issues when it came to Section Eight. Right, he had a bit of a moral standpoint, um, some some issues with Section Eight. Didn't like what they were doing. Really stood up for himself. Um, and so he had a lot of vacancy, vacancy issues. And, and according to him, he had about 13 or 14 houses uh, that went vacant for three to four months. So when I was on the phone with him and I was kind of getting this information, just collecting data, well, I kind of went through my phone and I just did 13 times 1600 because that's what he was averaging in rent per house. And I kind of multiplied that by four, right? Because he, he lost four months of rent for those 13 houses. And if we do that number, we go 83,200. Now, obviously, that 83,200 has to be subject uh, to expenses as well. Do not fall for this trap. A lot of sellers will say, well, I had vacancy, so I should get, you know, this rent that I've lost. Well, you know, getting that rent, you still it's still proportional to the expense. You have to minus the expense in doing that, right? Uh, so what I did is I took 83,200, which is the number you get if you do 13 times 1600 times four, right? And I took the, and I subtracted the expense ratio. And here's another thing that you want to really, really understand. You want to understand what is the expense ratio for that particular market, right? What is the expense ratio? I can tell you guys right now, 
typical expense ratio for, for a county that has a metropolitan city like Chicago uh, or Los Angeles or New York, that's, again, in a democratic state. And I'm not bashing any one political. I'm just telling you how it is. Based on me as a real estate investor, I'm just telling you what I observe, right? The typical expense ratio for uh, a place, you know, a place that shares county borders, like with Chicago, typically you're going to be about 60 to 65%, right? If you're looking at a secondary market, right? Typically I'm at about 40 to 50%. If you do all the numbers, I can make another video on that. Feel free to comment down below. If you want me to make a video typically on what makes real estate expenses. If you want me to talk about that, I'll give you exact percentages based on what I've observed with hundreds and thousands of deals that I've looked at. All right. So going back, so we got to take that 83,000 and we got to take the expense ratio out. Now I understand, right. And some of you guys may be watching and say, well, Daniel, some expenses are fixed, whether, you know, whether you have this much income or you have that low income, I completely understand, right. Completely understand. So typically when I have a situation, I'll assess the situation based on all the other questions that I've asked. And in this scenario, a lot of this guy's expenses were fixed based on, you know, talking to his maintenance guys, walking around the property. And, you know, obviously at this point in my career, I kind of know what I you know like to look for. So what I did is I, I, and this is again, what I usually do, I'll take that 65% number and I'll divide it in half. If I see that a good chunk of the expenses are fixed uh, relative to the income. So obviously 65 divided by half, you're going to get 32.5%. So with that 83, uh, two, I just took 33% out. I took a third out because obviously 32.5 is close to 33%, right? So I just took a third out and all I did was literally just do 83,200, which I have in my calculator right here. And I multiplied it by 0.66, right? So you multiply the 83,200, times 0.66, uh, I got, and if, again, if you're following the math, I don't know what you got, but I got $54,912, which again, I'm going to add that to the NOI, right? So I'm going to add 220, 765, and I'm going to add the additional $54,912. So I've already got 54912 here, so I'm just going to add that 220, 765. So for those of you following at home, you should have gotten a grand total of 275, 677. Now, before you move on, you've got to add this 83,200 to that number. Now, obviously, this has already counted for vacancy, right? Because no one's going to charge that number in rent, right? If you get your rent scheduled every single time, Typically, this gross rent income, right, or gross income in your Schedule E is going to have two zeros attached to it at, at, at the end, right? But obviously, he had some vacancy issues. I'll go ahead and put that into 33% because vacancy obviously is not a fixed expense, right? It can defer. One year, you can have 20% vacancy. One year, you can have 0% vacancy. So I'm going to go ahead and add that 83,200. Uh, but what I actually did in my scenario is uh, I, I had that added in, but I, I just took away like 5% for vacancy, right? 5, 10% for vacancy. So uh, I kind of just did cowboy math and I just added 70,000. This 10% is actually 85, closer to 85, but uh, here it goes. I'm sorry, 75. So I'll just go ahead and put 75 anyways, right? Just, I know a lot of you guys are detail oriented OCD and probably had a stroke when I got the math wrong. So I'm going to go ahead. So we got the whopping total of 275 and I'm going to go ahead and add that 348, 327. I'm going to add that $75,000, right? So that's going to give me a gross income closer to 423. Three, two, seven. Now, if we take this number together and that number, uh, we get our expense ratio. All right, so we got 65%, but that implies that 35% is actually going to be the expenses. 
I'm a little worried right now because Sam's smiling. That implies that somebody probably made a comment. I don't know what it feels about. Maybe it's my my little thing that I've got going on here. But Jay Massey's in the house. Jay Massey is in the house. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite mentors uh, and somebody that I look up to very much, Jay Massey is in the house. Uh, feel free to check out his YouTube channel, Cashflow Diary. Guys, this guy is an amazing dude. I look up to him in so many ways. I got to see him negotiate a deal when we were at a conference together in Utah. Jay, we love you, man. You are the man. Thank you for being on our podcast. Um, and if, if you want to see that podcast, right, check out the Quack Brothers, subscribe, but also uh, subscribe to the, the Cashflow Diary. Jay Massey's videos, again, are phenomenal. So you got to take that 277, 67. See, now I'm nervous because Jay, because Jay's watching, right? I'm super nervous now. Uh, I, he's again, we love you, Jay. All right. So we're going to take that 275, 677, and we're going to add some expenses that I'm going to include in there because again, I want to hire a property manager and I want to count extra reserves for maintenance. So I'm going to take 5% maintenance. I'm also going to do a uh, 10% management. So that's a grand whopping total of 15% out of that four two three three two seven so i'm going to go ahead and take that four two three three two seven and i'm going to multiply that by 0 0.15 and of course if we do the math again if you're following home i don't know what you got but i got sixty three thousand four nine nine point zero five add a nickel in there right so I'm just going to go ahead and just change that to a five zero zero, right? Just so we can get uh, good numbers going. All right. So subtract that sixty three five from you guess you know it right two seventy five six seventy seven. All right. So I got two twelve one seventy seven, which for those of you who know is the official Fahrenheit number for two twelve which means that this deal is literally boiling hot, right? See what, see what I did there? All right, sorry, I'll stop. Okay, so we got 212. That's our new and true improved NOI. So 212, 177. And again, guys, this is so critical. You have to consider what expenses you're going to have, right? I cannot tell you how many sellers, how many investors that I've met who put together a bad deal, who under delivered to their lenders and their investors because they didn't account the expenses that they were going to have as the landlord, right? So that's our new NOI, 212-177. And again, this is where we figure out our cap rate. Okay, so we get the number of 212, 177. And again, guys, when I initially calculated the cap rate, I actually just took 423, 327. I subtracted 65. Um, if we go ahead and do that just for the sake of running the number, right? We get closer to about 150 right closer to about 150 uh and i did and, and again the seller ha did say that he had some legal problems in there so he had to add that number back in so uh i believe when i when i did the numbers with uh the seller uh i got around like 159 right 159,000 as the true uh noi obviously that's a big difference from 212 um but you know it, typically when i try and and talk with the seller I try and get that NOI as low as possible, right? And that's obvious because, you know, a lot of sellers like to kind of boost up their numbers. You know, they like to say this, they like to say, well, you know, uh, I had $70,000 in this and that's typically not gonna happen. So when we were on the phone, uh, I got him down to about 159, um, which if we do the numbers again on the uh, asking price of 1.9 million, um, we get about 8.3. Right, 8.3. But when we go back, we got 148 when I did the actual number uh, minus what the seller said. That gives us about a 7.8.
So that's kind of in the beginning. That's why we had that 7.8 to about 8.2 in range uh, because that was the cap rate uh, when I was on the phone with the seller. But obviously when we calculate the cap rate with the numbers we just ran right now of 212, 177, we're gonna get a different number, right? So let's go ahead and do the math. So everybody, when we're calculating the cap rate again, that equation uh, is NOI divided by purchase price equals cap rate. And again, don't forget, when you're buying with cap rate, if you're using cap rate as comparables, do not forget, understand and know for sure what is the market cap rate in that area, right? I can tell you right now, cap rate is very easily manipulable. Manip manipulable? Manipulable. It's very easy to change, right? Uh, it's very easy to change and manipulate. If you go to down, you know, the south side of Chicago, the dangerous parts, you know, you got a bad deal when you're buying it for 12% cap rate, right? Uh, but at the same time, if you go to a place like Naperville, Illinois, which is, you know, the, probably one of the most affluent neighborhoods, you've got a good deal when you buy it for 7 or 8% cap rate, right now especially. So let's go ahead and run that number. We're going to go to 212 divided by 177. We're going to divide that by 1.9 million. And again, if you're following at home, that gives us a cap rate. of 11.4%, right? So the actual number given to me by the calculator was 0 0.1143, but obviously as we learn in elementary school, uh, thanks Mrs. Doc Savage, if you're watching right now, um, it's been a long time, right? Your, your sixth grade boy has grown up for sure and he's doing pretty well in life. All right, so we gotta move those two decimal points. That gives us a cap rate of 11.4%. Again, this market competitively is a nine percent cap rate so i'll tell you kind of currently where i'm at in the deal um the asking price is set at 1.9 million um but you know the seller is kind of asking for 26 percent down and what's very funny i don't see this a whole lot especially in illinois i see this more in places like indiana michigan uh kind of the smaller states like ohio um you know the, the, the seller actually uh and, uh, the seller actually recommended and, and preferred and wanted uh, and proposed seller financing. So I was a little taken back, but of course he wanted 26% down, uh, which in this deal was relatively about 500 K. Now here's another negotiation tactic. Uh, don't give up your value so easily, right? Always have a cost and effect virtue. And I always say again, another really good sales technique. Again, in another video that I shared is the ask don't tell method, right? So if you want to check that out, um, the link should be in the description below. It's the, it's, I'm paraphrasing, but the title is like the number one te technique in sales and negotiating, uh, but feel free to check that out. So it's $500,000 and I'm at a standstill where the seller wants 3.75 interest rate. Uh, I've got it at 30 year Amort, uh, no balloon. So that's pretty good for me, right? Uh, he also included in a clause, which I kind of negotiated of no prepayment penalty which for those of you guys that have watched uh, our most popular YouTube video on the Kwok Brothers, right? How to pay off a mortgage in five to seven years. You know that if you've got a, a no prepayment penalty clause in a contract, especially on uh, an installment contract as the IRS would describe it, AKA seller financing, you know how valuable that's gonna be if you're not paying any prepayment penalty for using a line of credit, a commercial line of credit to chunk down that amortization possibly taking that 30 year and paying it off in 10 guys ima imagine that imagine owning a 1.9 million dollar portfolio 20 houses having it paid off in five to seven years maybe even 10 years right i mean you're talking about extreme amounts of cash flow increase so instead of le out leveraging yourself and buying another building why not just calculate the cash flow you're going to get by paying down the portfolio a lot sooner and actually having no risk in terms of your LTV ratio, right? Especially when banks are increasing their reserve requirement, monetary policy is starting to tighten up and rates are again expected to rise in December three times next year, right? So we got to keep that in mind. So this is at a 30 year amortization. What I'm trying to get out of this guy is actually 2% interest. So we're kind of in this range right now. And again, we're in the middle of negotiation. Um, 
I'm anticipating uh, at least right right now we're anticipating uh, a 12 percent cash on cash return for the investor. Again, anticipate. We're not guaranteeing it because obviously you can't do that. Uh, but I'm anticipating an eight to 12 cash on cash return for our lenders. Right. Uh, so that's basically the premise of the deal. And right now it is 740. I've been on this thing for 40 minutes. Wow. Um, so I'll go ahead and leave it up to questions. If there are any, I want to spend the next five minutes uh, for questions and answers. So DJ Sam, do we have any questions on deck? No, we are. Uh, awesome. I did a phenomenal job, I think. Uh, so again, guys, don't forget, click that subscribe button. Me and Sam actually are very intentional about making more videos uh, on a weekly basis. We're anticipating about what, four, four or five releases every single week? four or five releases. And I'm very happy to announce that we're actually going to be making videos, not only on real estate investing, but we're actually going to start making videos on business. Uh, I'm going to be sharing a lot of negotiation tactics that I've you know, been tried and true over the years, uh, sales techniques. I'm also going to start teaching uh, materials um, and sharing valuable things that I've used even in my personal life uh, to increase relationships and actually how to be, you know, for example, how to be a better listener and really kind of understand uh, how to assess situations and how to have that be your advantage, uh, especially in a business conduct. So uh, click that subscribe button, click on that notification bell. Um, oh, before I forget, before I leave, uh, feel free to again, join our free Facebook group that we've got. Link is in the description below. It's called Real Estate Investors Mastermind Group, right? Is there is there an S after mastermind? No, no so real estate investors, Master, mastermind group, right? Again, we post a lot of free content, uh, trying to add as much value to you guys as you possibly can. So uh, have a wonderful evening, guys. I hope this information helped. If you have a question, comment down below or go to the quackwithers.com and contact us. Uh, we always like making new friends. So uh, hope this was helpful. Uh, again, hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Happy holidays. Merry Christmas and God bless. Uh, and God bless the United States of America. <laughs> All right, guys, I'll see you later.